Hello, welcome to First Chapter Friday. Today's story is by the amazing author, Walter Dean Myers. He's the one that wrote Monster, which was turned into a Netflix show, and I have done a First Chapter Friday with graphics in like maybe two years ago, and it's one of the most popular ones that I have done. So this time, the book is Kick. And Kick, as you can see, is written by Walter D. Myers and Ross Workman. So the story with this is, there was a young man back in 2007 who was only 13 years old, that was Ross, and he wrote a letter to his absolutely favorite author. And then the author wrote back. He said he would be willing to collaborate with Ross, who said he wanted to be a writer, and this is the book they made together. So the story is going to be telling alternate viewpoints between the main character, Kevin, who is a 13-year-old boy who is a soccer player, and his mentor, who is Mr. Brown. And you'll find out more about him in a moment. Chapter 1 Bill Kelly and I had been friends since we played high school basketball together. I had played strong forward, and he had been the quick guard with the sweet outside shot. He had always been bright, and the kind of kid who did his homework on time and worried about his grades. I was always more relaxed. After high school, I went into the army and then on to the police force, and Bill went on to law school. I knew he would do well, and he did. But he really came into his own when he became a judge. He always seemed to look to do a bit more than he had to do for the community as well as for the people who came through his courtroom. So when he called me and asked me if I wouldn't mind coming down to his office to talk about a case he had interest in, I was flattered. It was only a 20-minute drive from my place to the Highland Municipal Courthouse. I parked in the rear of the old Art Deco structure, went through the double doors and past the cafeteria, and made my way to the elevator bank in the east end of the building. Judge Kelly's office was on the third floor, and I arrived at two minutes to the hour. Ms. Weinberg, Kelly's secretary, smiled as she picked up the phone. Sergeant Brown is here, sir, she said. A moment later, the frosted door opened, and Judge Kelly, nearly as lean as he had been in his playing days, stepped out. Come on in, Jerry, he said, extending his hand. How are you doing these days? I'm good, I said, fighting the battle of the bulge. Looks like even the salads are fattening these days. You need to come jogging with me, he said going behind his desk. I noticed that there was a young officer already seated in one of the chairs facing the judge. Sergeant Jerry Brown, this is Scott Evans. He made the arrest of the young man I'm interested in, Judge Kelly said. Hey, how's it going? The young officer stood and extended his hand. It's going well, I answered. Sergeant Brown's been interested in keeping young people out of trouble for a long time. And as I mentioned to you before, we've talked about cases in which we might be able to intervene and keep a kid on the right path, Judge Kelly said. This young man's father was a policeman. Was? I asked. You remember Johnson, young officer who got caught up in a shootout a few years ago? Kelly leaned back in his chair and clasped his hands behind his neck. Yeah. He was a good young... His kid is in trouble? I was looking at the arresting officer. Scott, why don't you fill Jerry in? Judge Kelly asked the officer. Evans took out his pad, took a few seconds to read his notes, then looked up at me. I was on patrol last night, just after nine, when I saw a Ford Taurus driving erratically on the street parallel to the highway. The lights weren't on, and the car was weaving. I thought it was a drunk, and I put my lights on. When I did that, the car sped up a bit, then braked, then sped up 
and then skidded into a light pole. No major damages, but I got the feeling whoever was driving was just lucky at that time. I told them over the loudspeaker to turn the engine off, and they complied. Then I ordered them out of the car. At first I thought it was an old skinny guy, and then I saw I was a kid. I checked the car, and there was a passenger, and she looked even younger than the driver. Okay, so I figured a couple kids making out in a moving car. I asked the kid for his driver's license, and he doesn't have one. I asked him how old he was, and he looks at me and says he's 13. I put my light on his face, and I see he's really young. His name is Kevin Johnson. His parents' car? I asked. No, it's the girl's father's car, Evan said. She's 13, and I looked at her face, and I see she's been crying. Her face is all puffy and red. I take the guy to the back of the car, and I ask him what's going on. He gives me a nothing, so I cuff him, and I tell him to sit on the sidewalk next to the car, and I go to the girl, and I ask her what's going on, and she gives me the same nothing, which incidentally pisses me off. I don't know the kid's the son of a policeman who's killed in the line of duty. You couldn't have known that, Judge Kelly said. So I get the girl's ID and her telephone number, and I call her house. I get the father, and I tell him I just stopped two kids in his car, and I ask him if he knows anything about it. What did he say? I asked. At first he doesn't say anything, and then, after he's been thinking for a minute, he says the kid driving it must have stolen it and made the girl go along. Okay, so it's a stolen car wrap. Kidnapping, driving without a license, damaging city property, the light pole, plus traffic violations. McNamara, that's the girl's father, says he doesn't have another car, and he's going to have to walk to where we were. I tell him to stay home, and I'll bring the girl to his house. Which is where? I asked. Eliston Place, Evan said, over past the water tower. Oh, okay. So I take the girl home and I ask the father if he wants to press charges, because the charges can be pretty steep, Evans continued. Meanwhile, I'm checking out the girl, and she's looking down, and the father's looking away from her, and the boy Kevin is just sitting in my car with his head down. Something's going on, I said. Yeah, but no one's talking. So I ask the father again, does he want to press charges? And he says, yes, Scott says. Then I asked the girl if the boy did anything to her, if he hit her or he touched her in any way, and she says no. The father tells me that his wife is sick, and is it okay if he comes down to the station to press charges in the morning? And I said, it was, and I told him where to come. That's it. You asked the girl if the boy hit her or touched her? I said. What did the father say? Did he look upset? Scott hesitated and then shook his head. No, he just took the girl into the house. According to the precinct desk sergeant, the father came in in the morning and uh, he asked a lot of questions about what would happen if he pressed charges and what would happen if he didn't, Judge Kelly said. He wanted to know if the girl would have to testify. What was your take on the situation? I asked the officer Evans. Do you think this boy, what's his name? Kevin, Kevin Johnson. Did you get the impression Kevin was forcing the girl into anything? I wasn't sure, Evan said, leaning forward in his chair. But as she turned to walk into the house, she looked back at him and smiled. I didn't know if it meant anything, but she smiled like she was saying everything's okay between them. And how did he look? His eyes were working, Evan said. He was looking around and thinking hard, but he kept his mouth shut. I asked him on the way to the station if he thought he was a tough guy. And what did he say? Nothing, not a word. So what do you want me to do? I asked Judge Kelly. Jerry, when we were talking about the program at the club, 
I knew we were thinking about young African-American kids, Judge Kelly said, pushing a file folder across the desk. This kid isn't African-American, but he is a police officer's son, and maybe a good young man. He's got no record, no trouble at school. I think McNamara, the girl's father, might not press charges. I don't know. This whole case is up in the air right now and can land in a lot of different places. If you have the time to look into it, I'll see what I can do, I said, standing. I thanked Evans and took the file. On the way home, I thought again about the meeting at the club and the talk about mentoring teenagers. A priest who was there, somewhat less enthusiastic than the rest of us, had talked about how complex some of the situations could get. I stopped at Holes, exclamation point, the donut shop on Evergreen, and I bought a dozen donuts, six glazed and six unglazed, and a medium coffee. The parking area was almost empty, and I thumbed through the file as I drank the coffee. There was no picture of young Mr. Johnson, and I wondered what he looked like. I imagined a surly kid with a slightly turned-up lip and a squint. I hadn't known his father personally, but I remembered the funeral of the young Irish-American officer, and I knew I must have seen the family. Every police funeral is a tragedy as far as I'm concerned, and I never wanted to dwell on them. The girl Christy and her family lived in the Brunswick section of town, a neighborhood that's changed a lot since I was a kid. It had been an industrial area, had declined for a while, but now was recovering as the old buildings were being converted into condos to attract an upscale crowd. I recalled there had been an investigation of possible exploitation of immigrant workers in the area. I drove home, transferred half the donuts to another plastic bag, and put them in the glove compartment. Carolyn would never understand the pressures that demand a full dozen. Inside the house, I called Gracie at the precinct and asked her to run a search on Michael McNamara. Drunk and disorderly, two years ago. He slapped his wife around a bit, but she refused to get an order of protection. And a citation four years ago for illegal parking. You in the office baseball pool this week? I never win the darn thing. Oh, stop whining, Jerry. You win it or not? I'm in it, I said. Carolyn saw the bag of donuts on the coffee table and gave me the look. Have you forgotten everything the doctor told you? She asked. I put on my best wounded face and handed over the sinful six. Chapter Two I kept my head down as I watched shoes pass me by. Shiny black heels clicking against the floor beat-up white Nike spotted with dirt stains. I sat shivering in the waiting room of the Bedford County Juvenile Detention Center. They had turned the air conditioner up extra high. I bet it was to make us feel even worse than we did, just by being in this place. My head was spinning, and I felt sick to my stomach. I couldn't believe I was locked up. I kept asking myself, why was I in this place? I was no criminal, but I knew. I couldn't tell the truth. My wrists burned from the handcuffs that the police had put on me when I was arrested. My shoulders ached. The cot they assigned me, it felt like concrete. Not that I could sleep anyway. The whole night was playing over and over in my head, like a bad movie I couldn't forget. I just wanted this mess to be over and to go home. But I didn't know how I would face Mom. The worst part about everything last night was seeing Mom when she came to the precinct. It wasn't like she was mad, just horribly disappointed and sad. In the middle of the night, I woke up to find the door being swung open. An officer was uncuffing another inmate. The kid was older than me. Happy to be back home, Morales, the officer said. I know you miss me. The kid shot back. Yeah, but I figured I'd see you again. I tried not to look at the kid as he got settled in. The tattoos on his shoulders ran down his arms. I wondered if he was in a gang. 
but I definitely wasn't going to ask them. I pretended to be asleep. In the morning, they brought us out to breakfast, and there were two fights before we reached the food counter. Some of the guys looked too old to be in a juvenile detention center. I wondered if some of them were in gangs because they were flashing signs at each other. I like to watch a show on TV called Gangland, where real gang members came and talked about the history of their gangs and what they did as members. But this wasn't TV. This was my life. I wished it wasn't. The food was greasy. I wouldn't have eaten it, even if my stomach felt okay. After breakfast, the guards walked us back to our cells. The uniforms we had to wear were a dull gray, which matched our moods. The guy in my cell, Morales, asked if I'd been arraigned yet. I shook my head no. I didn't know what he was talking about, but I didn't want to ask him. Uh, That's when you find out what's going to happen to you, he said. Don't be acting too tough, man. Maybe you can cop a break. The guy looked hard, and every other word that came out of his mouth was a curse. He told me what was wrong with the place and who to avoid. I was surprised he was being friendly, but he also seemed mad at the world, like it had given up on him. The whole time he was talking, I could feel my heart beating against the inside of my chest. It didn't feel like a tough heartbeat either. All morning I sat around trying to think through what was happening, but I was too scared to concentrate. When the guard came and called my name, I hardly recognized it. He said I had a visitor in the interview room. I hoped it was Mom. I hoped it was her even though I felt terrible about her seeing me in jail. The interview room was painted a pale white. I glanced up at the clock every now and then. It was behind a metal grill like it it was locked up too. I imagined all the things the clock would have done to be in here. I guess he'd have to do his time, though, I thought, and then I laughed for the first time since the arrest. I sat alone on the hard plastic chair for nearly 15 minutes before the door opened. I watched a pair of big brown shoes stop inside the door and then step toward me. I slowly lifted my head. A tall black man with broad shoulders wearing a shirt and tie. He looked down at me with surprise on his face. Kevin Johnson? He asked. Yes, I said standing. I wondered what he wanted with me. I'm Sergeant Jerry Brown, he said, putting out his hand. I shook it. Here you got yourself into some trouble, huh? I nodded. You want to tell me about it? Not really. He couldn't expect me to tell him anything. I didn't even know him. He sat down in the chair next to me. I hoped he was as uncomfortable as I was in the hard plastic seat. Kevin. Let me tell you something about myself. I'm a police officer, just like the one who arrested you. Just like your father was. Judge Kelly asked me to look into your case, because he had a lot of respect for your father. I did too, he said. I'd like to try to help you if I can. You know, the charges, don't you? Driving without a license, I said. Driving without, uh, he looked away and then back at me. Try kidnapping, grand theft auto, destruction of property, and giving false answers. We're talking felonies, not misdemeanors. Kidnapping? I didn't know they charged me for kidnapping. They got it all wrong. I tried to stay calm. A felony? What's that? It's a really serious type of crime, Kevin. I didn't do anything. Weren't you driving the car that crashed last night? You could do yourself a favor and tell me now, or you could, if you want, do it in front of 12 other people who couldn't care less about you. So why do you care what happens to me? Sergeant Brown raised his eyebrows. Judge Kelly said you needed some straightening out. He asked me if I wanted to help you, and I said I'd give it a try. But you need to be honest with me. With some straight answers and a little luck, you might, just might, 
not have to stay in here. You are interested in getting out. Sergeant Brown spoke in a voice that meant business. He looked at me, waiting for an answer. All I want is to go home, I said. It's not that simple, young man, Sergeant Brown said. You're going to have to go to the judge's chambers and explain a lot of things to him and tell them in a way to make him think you deserve to leave here tonight. I'm not that good at explaining things, I said. The cop who handcuffed me, he didn't believe me. Sergeant Brown kind of puffed up, shook his head a little, and he exhaled. Just what are you good at? he asked. I don't know, soccer, I guess, I answered. But that's not going to help me in here, is it? The tournament lottery is tomorrow. Which means? The lottery for the state cup. That's the most important soccer tournament in New Jersey. The brackets will be posted tomorrow so we'll know what team will play in the first round. You're in jail for a bunch of felonies. And you're thinking about soccer? I don't know what to think about, I said. I, I don't even know if I'm thinking straight. That shut him up for a few minutes. So, Kevin, what position do you play? Sergeant Brown asked me. Striker, I said. Is that a defense or an offense? Sergeant Brown asked. You don't know anything about soccer, right? I asked. Not really, he answered. And you don't know much about the law, so maybe we can both learn something. What do you think? Sounds okay, I guess. Sergeant Brown stood up. Now, we're going to talk it over with your mom, he said. Then we're going to meet with Judge Kelly and see if he wants to keep you in here. Keep me in here? Maybe I should have been a little nicer to this man. I wanted to throw up. The door to the room inched open, and my mom and my grandma slowly came in. Mom's face was stained with tears. Abuela, my grandma, she seemed smaller. She walked behind Mom. They took seats across from Sergeant Brown and me. About four years ago, my abuelo died. That's when Abuela came from Colombia to live with us. I loved her almost as much as I love Mom. Mom worked six days a week as an assistant in the doctor's office. Abuela had been taking care of me since I was nine. Ay, mi nito! Abuela sounded so sad. She put her hands on my cheeks. I could see the tears were welling up in the corners of her eyes. I felt like crying, too, but I didn't want to cry in front of Sergeant Brown. Mom, this is Sergeant Brown, I said softly. He wants to talk to you. Nice to meet you, my mom said politely. Her voice was cracking. I hated to see my mom sad. She's already been through so much. Abuela, le presento al señor Brown, I said, introducing Abuela to Sergeant Brown in Spanish. Sergeant Brown turned to my mom. Ma'am, I'm a police officer and also a friend of Judge Kelly. He asked me if I would look into Kevin's case. We'll be talking to the judge in a few minutes, and I'm hoping that everything will turn out all right. But there are a lot of unknown aspects to this case. Most important is that Kevin needs to explain what happened. Kevin's a good boy, Mom said. He really is. Believe me, he's never been in any kind of serious trouble. I believe you, and I'm sure you want him home. If he gets to go home, I'll be talking with him from time to time as the case develops. Is that okay with you? Now I'm going to be frank. Your son is in trouble. He is up against serious charges. I'm sure that if Kevin gets out and there's the least bit of trouble, he's coming back here. I really appreciate your taking an interest in my son, sir. My mother sat back in her chair her hands shaking with nervousness. Well, we don't want our young people in jails if we can help it, ma'am, Sergeant Brown said. Sergeant Brown kept talking to Mom and Abuela. 
I thought about this television show where two cops were interviewing a guy. One was playing the good cop role and the other one was the bad cop. I wondered if Sergeant Brown was playing the good cop or the bad cop. Mom kept nodding to anything Sergeant Brown said. Abuela just looked at me and kept shaking her head. I was glad when a guard came into the room. Judge Kelly was ready to see us. The guards drove me in a van to Highland Municipal Courthouse. It was an old brick building with white columns in the front that looked something like on the cover of my social studies textbook. Mrs. Fox, the lawyer who handled the paperwork when my dad died, was waiting for us in the hallway. I walked in with a guard behind me. I was relieved to see a familiar face, even though I really didn't know her that well. It was weird having someone watch my every move. I noticed the guard's gun. When I was little, my dad used to show me his gun. He always warned me about how dangerous guns were, and I used to think it was so cool. But now that the guard who was watching me had one, guns didn't seem so cool anymore. The guard saw me staring at his gun. I turned away. I didn't even want to imagine what my father would have said if he were still alive. I had just been helping out a friend. After going through the metal detectors, Mom, Abuela, the guard, and I walked down the hall and up a long flight of steps to the judge's chambers with Sergeant Brown trailing behind. Judge Kelly was the tallest man I'd ever seen. I wondered if he had ever played basketball. His wire rim glasses made him look smart. I imagined him playing college ball. My mom, Abuela, and I took seats, and Mrs. Fox started speaking in low tones to the judge. I could tell that it was about me. Mr. Johnson, I presume, Judge Kelly said, his glasses lowered on his nose. Yes, nice to meet you, sir, I answered, standing up and trying to be extra polite. Jerry, how are you? Judge Kelly said. I turned around to see Sergeant Brown sitting behind us. Up for another game of ping pong at the Ebony Club? Asked Sergeant Brown. Not tonight. I'm uh, swamped with work, Judge Kelly said, looking right at me. Judge Kelly turned to me. So, Kevin, you're charged with kidnapping, grand larceny, destruction of property, and giving false answers. Yes, sir. I said. Mrs. Fox interrupted. Judge Kelly, Kevin has never been in any sort of trouble before. The only reasonable solution would be to give him probation. We're going to give him every break we can under the law, Judge Kelly said. There are a number of issues to be worked out first. This is not a victimless affair, and the victim's rights have to be considered. Frankly, I don't understand how the son of one of our town's finest police officers could have gotten involved in something like this. Kevin, can you explain yourself? I, I just, just did it, I guess, I said. I'm so sorry. There were things I couldn't really explain. Judge Kelly frowned at me. He could frown at me all he wanted, but I still didn't want to get a friend in trouble. I'd like uh, some time to look into the matter, if the court will allow that. Sergeant Brown spoke up. Kevin has good family ties, and as his attorney pointed out, he has a clean record. It can take forever, Jerry, Judge Kelly said. Our calendars are crammed. I don't have to tell you that. No, sir. Sergeant Brown said, crossing one leg over the other. I'll either dispose of the case in three weeks or I'll send it to another judge, Judge Kelly said. In the meantime, I'm going to release young Mr. Johnson to his mother. As soon as I heard that, I wanted to thank Judge Kelly and Sergeant Brown over and over again. I had to pick up my clothes and Mom had to sign a bunch of forms at the detention center so I could leave. I couldn't believe I was out so quick. In the car on the way home, I could feel the tension. My mom finally broke the silence. Kevin, if you get yourself into any trouble at all, 
Even if you're just with someone who gets in trouble, you're going to be sent back in there. You have to be careful who you hang out with. Do you understand that? Mom was so upset. She didn't even turn back around to look at me as she was talking. I can't believe this is happening to our family. That was about as close as Mom ever got to raising her voice. I'm so sorry, Mom, I answered, and I meant it. Even though I had only been locked up for one night, I never wanted to go back to that place again. Abuela always talked too much, but she had nothing to say to me now. That was almost worse. We made one stop at a bakery to pick up some almohabanas, Colombian breads filled with cheese. This is my favorite food. Even though she was mad, Mom was being extra nice. But I wasn't hungry. On our way home, we drove downtown. It wasn't the weekend, but there were groups of kids from my school hanging around. I closed my eyes and slumped down in my seat. I knew they would have heard about me getting arrested, and I'd have to answer a million questions from them. I thought about Christy. I wondered if she was as scared as I was. I remembered that when the cop had pulled us over, I had turned to her, and she hadn't said a word. The cop that arrested me thought that she was just too scared to talk, but I knew there were things that were just too hard to say. Sergeant Brown seemed all right. At least he got me out of the juvie, and he didn't feel sorry for me like my mom and grandma did. I liked that. As we drove along, I saw a green turf of Highland Field shining under the lights. The facility had been built recently after a long, heated argument between the town council members and the taxpayers. My mom used to joke that I better enjoy the new soccer fields because the money for them came straight out of her pocket. Now I wondered whether I'd ever get to play soccer again. Okay, I hope you feel like you got enough of each character to want to find out what happened originally and what happens to Kevin. In the rest of the story, you find out that maybe because of his father not being alive anymore, maybe other things are going on in his life, but Kevin definitely has a chip on his shoulder, and at a drop of a hat, he can get really angry. There's a little bit more to Kevin than we originally are led to believe. I will say that you'll finish reading this book and feel very satisfied. All right, please read and enjoy, and I'll see you next week.